Hi everyone, uh, welcome to Brewers. Our our meeting today is like the, the the last meeting this year. It's like December. So happy to see you the past one year and we'll see you in the next episode <laughs> next year. Yeah. <laughs> so uh in this uh in this fourth of December, uh we have four members joining us as usual. We want to talk about the very deep uh it's like uh, we prioritize the quality over quantity. And uh, as your host today, uh, I'll be sharing the screen as your guidance in sharing the book. So book brewers, December 2021 question guide. So in today's session, I'd like, to, I'd like you to share. Uh, the first is what's the best key lesson from the book that you read? And then second, what's your favorite part of the book? Like, uh, do you have any particular part that interests you or make you stop reading and reflecting yourself or like, oh, your aha moment maybe? And the third one is about your, what's your least favorite? This is maybe the part of you don't like it most, but still like, hmm, something that you believe the writer can be, can do the improvement. And the fourth, uh, how did it impact you? How did it impact you? Because I believe that whatever we, we read, uh, we, we get any income, uh, what, what things are also important are the outcome. So I would like us to share uh, how the book impacted us in our daily life, directly or indirectly. And the, la the last, did this book remind you of any other books? Hmm. Usually, uh, dots are connected. So by sharing this number five, uh, I believe that we can have broader view about the, the example and the contra example. <laughs> so we can have both sides and different point of view. So yes, to start here, I would like to invite uh, who is the, who came to the who came to the room first? Because I was late today. <laughs> of course I was because I opened it, but I don't want to start. I'm doing my skincare right now. <laughs> <laughs> so Fajar, usually Fajar uh, needs to leave early, right? Uh, no, I have to prepare my PPT first. Maybe don't help. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I need to prepare something so that I have uh, an excuse. <laughs> All right, then. You need to prepare your lunch first, then. <laughs> All right, <laughs> then I'll be sharing first then. Uh, because no one is ready at the moment. Uh, this is the, oh, uh, is it okay if I start first? Yes. All right, uh, my first book is, uh, this one is Goals. Goals, how you get everything you want faster than you ever thought possible. It's a book by Brian Tracy. I'll be sharing the link below on the Zoom chat here. Oops, where is it? Okay. Voila. Okay, goals. The title is Goals. Basically, it's about, the, about how we usually, uh, how we can get reach our goal faster and wait oh, where is my screen can you see my screen still okay ah. so this is about uh how we can achieve the goal more effectively because uh everyone has goals so that's why i'm interested in this book because many people have their own goals but many people also fail reaching their goals so what's actually make people fail in in reaching their goals, reaching their dreams. So that's why I, I was interested to read this book. And the best key lesson from this is, actually the goals is start, it starts with mindset, the right mindset. So um, in the book, this is the key points that I can share is actually the right mindset. Think, uh, there are four about right mindset it's like the first is take responsibility of your own life any change you want 
to make it your life is entirely up to you. This is uh, like the thing that I have a friend working in Mandiri Bank and in Mandiri they said that the culture is everything because of you. Uh, it's like the, the, it's avoiding the victim mentality, which is, I completely agree because everything is because of us. So we need to take responsibility for the repercussion and uh, the impact caused by, by the, our, our acts. Because no matter how small it is, how, no matter how small it is, it will impact our life as well as our surrounding. So take responsibility of our own life. This is like okay, get it. I, I I like this one, and then the second is clarify clarify your values. Goals that aren't aligned with your values will lead to unhappiness. This is ha uh, this happened. Uh, in some some biographical book, I believe that people already reached their top, but they feel nothing up there. And I got this feeling two years ago when I got very high paying from a company, but the the thing that I did was against my values. Uh, economically, I economic. Uh, we see financially, I got uh, more than what I needed. But uh, when I had the money, I had the uh, like the freedom. I didn't got the, the satisfaction inside. So clarify your values is resonate with my, my, my belief now. OK, I agree with this second point. And then the third one, the author mentioned about reject self-limiting beliefs. Whatever you strongly believe in comes true. So uh, this is also connected with uh, like law of attraction thing or whatever it is. <laughs> but uh, whatever we believe will come true. It's like a affirmation, like a pray. If we keep believing it, and it will come true eventually. So same like whenever we we buy a new car, we suddenly realize that there are lots of people having the same car like ours. So uh, strongly believe in positivity will lead us to the goal. But in this point, reject self-limiting beliefs. I, I, I had an experience like I was limited my belief. Uh, I had this limiting self-limiting belief and it is difficult for me to even realize that this was my limiting belief. So this is actually a paradox because when I was there, I didn't realize that this is my limiting belief. Sometimes like I didn't realize. And then when I realized it, I couldn't get out of it. So hmm, it's not as easy as it's written here, <laughs> but I can relate. Uh, so I, I see the gap here is if people realize they have limiting beliefs, then they need to seek coach or need to seek mentor. We, uh, I advise like seek professional help to overcome this. It's impossible. It's almost impossible to, I mean, it's possible, but it's, it's going to be very difficult to, to get out of self-limiting belief if we don't enrich ourselves with a lot of outcome, with strong outcome. Like, for example, like videos or uh, the right literature, and then the fourth, uh, visual, visualize your future. Think five years ahead, focus on the positive, visualize often, and take actions. <coughs> visualize your future, I couldn't agree more because I tried this <coughs> and it happened. So, uh, but the problem is upon realizing, upon visualizing, we have to believe at like at least 1% that we really can achieve it. For example, I, I, I believe that tomorrow I will be the president deep down inside my heart, beneath my heart, like I, I, I don't believe it, then it's impossible. But if we have like small amount of belief there, then it will come through, hopefully. But yes, the author mentioned that we need to visualize our future. However, there are things that I, I, I think uh, I don't really like is about the, the author tends to sell that uh, he was from nothing to something like the zero to hero family uh, recipe, the same that we, we find. 
Uh, but here, if I see, he doesn't consider the fact that he had one factor in his favor, his race, because Brian Tracy is white. And according to CBS News by- A I'm, man. Sorry? And a guy. Oh, yeah. And the gender is a guy. Oh, yeah. That's and an okay. advantage. <laughs> It, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There are lots of factors as well. Like in the bring also uh, um, 10,000 10, things he mentioned about uh, Malcolm Gladwell also mentioned did right? That there are lots of factors. And a white person with graduate degree has 37 chance of becoming millionaire versus black person 6.7 uh, compared to Hispanic as well, Latinos as well, mm, Hispanics. In America, so this thing, if 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 uh, we are from the uh, like from from Asia and from other countries that we if we don't see the the thing more deeply, then we we tend to believe what what it's written, while actually it might not be as 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 simple as that. Like Steve Jobs mentioned, like love your uh, do what you your passion, but actually there are lots of things behind that words that quotes. Like we need to like to do whatever needed, but we need to love that thing. It's not like uh, people misinterpret it with like do what you love, and it leads to like non ikigai, only do the the thing that they love, but no one needs it. It's like the same analogy like we throw a party, but no one comes. <laughs> And how did this book remind of uh, any other books? Uh, from the book, I can see from the book. Uh, the answer, the answer, uh, the answer here is also uh, also the thing uh, quite remind me about. Oh, ha, yeah, I, I'll go to number four later on. This book reminds me of this because the answer answer all of the basic things that the author uh, mentioned. So this book is also very good, uh, for especially for 20s, people in 20s, 30s, uh, this is very good. But I think I read it a long time ago and still, sometimes I still open because it resonates very well. And how did this impact me is- uh, The answer by who? Sorry, Michael. By Alan, Alan and Barbara Peace. Oh, Alan Trebek. Yeah, like, oh, okay. man from Mercury or something. Venus. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. I'm looking it up. Okay. Mm. The answer. And how did it, this impact uh, me? Is like I realize that the success is a journey, long journey. It's not about what you do, but it's also who you are. <laughs> I can relate this uh, because I see see uh, in front of my eyes in my surrounding that the factor of who you are is also very, very important. It's not what you do, but it's also who you are. And I realized that success is not a night, it's a not a short story process. How even our media surround, surround us, they often like have two sides of magazine. They mentioned that uh, he was broke. And then on the next page, we find the success <laughs> in the, in, in only in two pages. And Ty Lopez, uh, one of the, the marketing guy that I like, also mentioned that to, to get what you want, you have to, des to, you have to deserve. Uh, world is fair. World is fair. It's not unfair like the majority of media portrays. The world is really, really fair. If we see that people is lucky, it's maybe we didn't see the 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 beneath the surface things behind the thing yeah thank you that's from me already 15 minutes from me yeah. question don't question oh yeah yeah any question uh for some reason it's crazy it reminds me of the book the magic of thinking big it's from the beginning until the end and almost sounds like plagiarism <laughs> What do you think about it? Uh, the magic is thinking big is about visualizing, if I'm not mistaken. I, I then about self-limiting belief and also from the first beginning until the, the only difference is only in the fourth part. But I don't think <laughs> it's ever mentioned in the uh, in the book here. 
I oh wait, let me open. I I didn't I didn't read the uh wait uh, the thinking big because uh yeah I didn't read the book only read uh, what's about but I I didn't know exactly what's in it so. It's very sebelas dua belas. Oh yeah. It, yes. You. Oh. Yeah. I just when I listen to your explanation, like this is awfully the same. <laughs> oh, oh, the difference is. Yeah. Uh, the difference in this book. Uh, there are also uh, other part actually, Mbak Pipit, but uh, it's about the uh, how how to achieve the goal. It's like it's broken down. Uh, it's break it. Yeah, I think down. number four. Number four is the one that are somehow a bit different, but one, two, three are totally the same. Uh huh. On and they uh, actually they they give uh, the author gives the step like for step one, step two, step three. Like number mm. one, figure out what you really want. It's like actually mm. also similar. Yeah. Figure out what you really want is actually basically the goal. Is right? there anything new that you didn't know before reading this book, and then you find out from this book? <laughs> uh. Already know, see, actually. Yes, yes. <laughs> like, so, like number. Huh? Is there nothing new, or is there, is there anything new? Uh, nothing new. Uh, because of, for example, uh, step two, believe you can achieve it. It's like it's back to uh belief. Like it's it's only the the bigger the big part they break down the smaller parts, right? Number three, uh, write it down. Write it down. I already know this concept as well. Like. Yeah, but I think this book is very useful for uh because it's kind of a compilation, so people just need to read this to get the the uh the whole idea instead of uh collecting from magic of thinking big and then like visualize your dream and then uh, about the law of attraction about your belief like we uh, it's more than three or four sources if I'm not mistaken, but it's like collapse here in one. But all of the take responsibility of your life and all the self limiting belief and all those it's like what this is totally magic of thinking thing. I will, I'll get the book. But anyway, uh, carry on. Donald, maybe has question. Yes, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned you mentioned that one of the points is that you need to align your goal with your value, and you, yeah, and you also mentioned that. In your previous job, it was financially well compensated, but you didn't feel the satisfaction from the job. So my question is, I don't know whether it's covered in the book or not, but from your experience, what gave you the courage to leave that well-paid position and to find something new? How can you find the courage? Because many people find it difficult if you are well compensated, right? Thanks. Oh yeah, uh, the 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 fifty percent is I already have my personal saving and emergency fund, so I I don't worry I I to lose that job, uh because I work every day with with very very horrible feelings and very stressful like cried a lot because of like I I need to like do very bad things, um and the other fifty percent is because I I was too confident. <laughs> Because I I thought that if I started the the business I will be I would be very successful at the time and I didn't realize that starting the job is is way more complex than what I had imagined. So uh, another fifty I I have the financial safety net and uh, the fifty is like narcissism <laughs> and yeah it's like uh <clears throat> but uh i'll be uh in the next in the future i'll be more careful in taking decisions though because when we are in the press and we are we were press pressurized in when i was very stressed like i couldn't think clearly that's the problem and when i consult with anyone like they they don't know because i know uh best except with a life coach because life coach can like uh, can take down what's in it what's inside me so but at the time i i didn't talk to any life coach so i took that decision okay and any thank you only any advice from the book about how to find your value oh no he did he, he doesn't mention about the value oh actually there is but uh the 
the value is way to clarify your value is by reviewing your past. Reflect on the experience that have increased your self-esteem and the choices you made in stressful situation. Because these tell you what's important to you. So reflect experience in the past, review the past, reflect on the experience that increased your self-esteem and the choices that made you yet you made in stressful situations because you, you you don't have any other choice to make like if you have only to choose one then that's the most important thing for you internally that you will choose yep if i can help michael a little bit i have uh, some steps from the magic of music about how to find your values yeah it's wow yes who copy who then yeah, this is 1978 man this is 1978 oh yeah this is 2004 okay, okay so 59 I mean, 59. 59. 59. Oh, 76. Yeah. Huh? Anyway, so, Donald, there's a checklist of questions you want to find your value. When I worry, what are the things I'm worried about, usually? That's the clue. Yeah. And then, what idea usually you have? Take notes of them. How do I look? How you look like shows your value, actually. So uh, what, what, what chapter is that? Because I have the book, but I haven't read it. Oh, page 160. I put it, I put it in a two. I fold yeah. it because this is yeah. uh, the, the chapter see. title. Yeah. Uh, chapter. What are you are what you think you are? You are what you think you are. Yeah. So what type of jokes I laugh and when I lose my temper, what, what I do, all of these things can be a clue to what values you actually have. <laughs> I have had the book in my library for a long time, but haven't read it. <laughs> I think I had also the book, but never read it. Like, okay, I, I think I know what's inside, <laughs> so I just put it on. <laughs> okay, okay. Next, it's 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 my privilege to choose. Or is there anyone who want to go first? Next. Hi, Nadias. Hello. Yes, yes, right. So our next speaker has come. Welcome. Huh? What do you <laughs> No. I can go next, though. I can go next. <laughs> okay, Mbak Pipit. I'll be sharing uh, quickly about the this one. Okay? So feel free uh, if you need me to share this again in the future. So what's the best key lesson, the favorite and least favorite, and then how it impacted your life? And does the book remind you of any other books? Okay, I will uh, screenshot this and post it somewhere because I might need to share a screen later. Mm -hmm. So the book I'm reading, actually I read this last month, uh, Capital and Other Writings by Karl Marx. So Das Kapital or Capital by Karl Marx is actually as big as the Bible, like this big. But I, of course, I didn't want I did not want to read it because that would take me several years to do. And it's rightly so that the book was so thick because it took him 20 years to write that book, right? So it's rightly so. What I read is the summary written, uh, edited by Max Eastman, but this is a book. So I don't carry it anywhere because I'm afraid of uh, ripping it down. It's already ripped here. Okay, anyway, I will. Yeah, already read here, <laughs> right? So things that uh, I can learn from it, let's see. Oh, and also Das Kapital was written 150 years ago. And that makes the language is very difficult. And also it was written in German and translated to English. So it is double difficult, right? So that's the reason why I'm reading the summary by Max Eastman. So what's the best key lesson from it? What's the best key lesson from it? First. Uh, this book talks about the weakness of capitalism, basically. So in the mid 1800s, 1856, 1856, when the book was published, it was the height of industrial revolution, right? So at the height of industrial revolution, he saw uh, a lot of bourgeois started to come up, right? A lot of people who got rich because of the industrialization but on the other hand, there are also a lot of people who are trapped in the factory, 
sometimes they never saw the sunlight. They're trapped in the mines, coal mines, whatever mines, right? They never saw the sunlight. So in the past, even the book mentioned, if you want to tell whether the person is rich or not, it's from their skin tone. So if your skin tone is dark, that means you're rich, rich, because you're free to travel and you get the exposed to the sunlight. But if those people who are poor was actually pale, that you know, that means you never enjoy the sun or something like that, never travel. Like that. And he saw a lot of people suffer because of the taking the brunt of capitalism. That's what inspired him to write about the nature of capitalism. And that's the book is called Das Kapital, is actually talking about capitalism. Right. So and the key lesson from it. So the key lesson from it is he said, uh, I have actually prepared something, but in an ideal world, we should not be worried about whatever situation we're born into, right? in an ideal world. So this is the reason why Karl Marx um, promoted socialism and communism, right? He had a really strong idea about what equality means to him. So imagine if you are, uh, if you live in a certain, if you're born into this world, you cannot choose how you're born into and what kind of family you're born into. You have to create a society when you don't have to worry you're born into what family. All of us have equal chance to be successful. This is what his dream was, basically, although it was not perfect, right? So that's the first one. In an ideal world, you shouldn't be worried about which situation you're born into. The second is actually related to the quote that I like. It's, he says, I will put it in the chat box. From each according to a, his ability to each according to his needs. Okay, I will. From each according to his ability. Is it there? Anyway, I'll just share it. <laughs> okay, so from each according to his ability and to each according to his needs. Yeah, and then everyone must have an equal chance to succeed. Now, and this one is the favorite quote from it. Another part that I really like is that uh, the conflict between the have and have nots have, have been the motor of history, basically. So class conflict result when those who do all the work Wait, okay, what? Yeah. Okay, the class conflict results when, uh, <laughs> my, uh, my mouse is conflicting right now. Class conflict results when those who do all the work rise up those who have all the money. So this is basically what he said. So eventually uh, capitalism will backfire because it, survives on exploiting the, ex the proletariat. So he divided the society into two classes, right? Bourgeois and proletariat. So bourgeois can be rich because they're exploiting the proletariat. And this will backfire someday, right? And then the backfire form of this is the form of the proletariat will fight against the bourgeois. And finally, fight the establishment and then dismantle it and then change the government, basically. So this is exactly what uh, Bolshevik, Bolshevik revolution did in Russia and also Mao Zedong did in China. He, they both of them inspired by Karl Marx book, Das Kapital. So they had a revolution against the establishment, in this case, it's political, uh, the government, right? And then after that, they implement the shared ownership of economy because there are people who are tired of being the wheel of the economy. So everyone must be that one. So that is basically the big idea of Karl Marx. You know what's crazy? 
Karl Marx was actually not a poor person. <laughs> he was considered, he was kind of a rich from a rich class, and he was very careless with his money, right? He when whenever he got money, he would purchase expensive watches. Is what he liked that time. So he collected expensive watches, for example. So I would I would say Karl Marx was a bit hypocritical, hypocritical, hypocritical in this case, because he talks about you know capitalism is bad, and then people revolt against. Uh, you know, the bourgeois and things like that, but he himself was also part of the bourgeois. So I'm not sure what he talked about when he said that, right? So that is uh, that thing that I like, and then what I don't like. What's the second one? So what's the favorite part of the book? What's the part of, part of the book is from the uh, quote I like earlier. Is, sorry, my uh, mouse is a bit crazy these days. From each according to his ability to each according to his needs. From each according to his ability to each according to his needs. So basically, we can have to contribute uh, to the best that we can, right? Even when we are uh, disabled or something, we still have something to contribute. And this is not different from what Hitler believed Marxism was about, because Hitler was different. Hitler wanted to exterminate people who are disabled that time. Right? This is totally not what Marxism was about. And then the last one is everyone should just be fulfilled. Their needs should be fulfilled, not more than that. So there's no people who live in excess, but everyone's needs must be fulfilled. So that is what I really like from this part. The next one is, what's the least favorite part of the book? The least favorite part of the book is he did not provide an alternative to capitalism, right? What he provided up to uh, other than capitalism was socialism and communism, right? But it was very violent and it doesn't have any guidance on how to implement it. Okay. Actually, this book dangerously inspired a lot of leaders, but it doesn't. It did not give good guidance how to achieve it. So, because of the way he explained his idea, a lot of these uh, leaders of country that time, Lenin and Mao Zedong, they interpreted that as violent revolution. So <laughs> that's how they carried out the idea of Marxism. Right. So I don't like violence, obviously, right? So this is the least favorite part of the book. Second, there's no guidance on how to actually implement the communism and socialism according to karma's ideals. Then it leaves a really dangerous open interpretation for people like Lenin and also, uh, who is the, op the replacement of Lenin? Stalin. Stalin, yeah. Stalin, Lenin, and Mao Zedong have totally different interpretation how to implement it. Yeah, so I wish because Karl Marx is so intellect, intelligent in writing books and was really thick, then I wish he could have in, included more about how to actually implement it. So people do not widely interpret these ideas, right? It was dangerous. And then last one is how did it impact you? How did it impact you? It impacted me in a way how it's crazy how one book can actually shape the course of history, I would say. You can, if you can imagine the Russian Revolution, even the establishment of China's Communist Party was inspired by this one book. Is that crazy? But also another book that also was inspiring, probably equally inspiring, is The Wealth of Nation by Adam Smith, right? The Wealth of Nation by Adam Smith also inspired industrial revolution. So totally the opposite of uh, the ideas or the opposite of Karl Marx, right? But also because of this book, a lot of countries adopted capitalism as their economic system, system of economy. So the lesson I get from it is how astonishing the impact of a book to shape the history. So that is uh, probably that I can 
share. And then what does it remind you of? It reminds me of a book by uh, Engel. Yeah, Engel is also a German philosopher. Um, and he talks about materialism, how everything in this world is shaped by materials, basically, right? Especially the history is shaped by the economic situation of that particular time. So everything that happened in history is actually influenced by money <laughs> as the drive of the history. So this book reminds me a lot of angles. So that's what I could share about Karl Marx's book. Good share and very, very, very amazing thing that how how one small small book <laughs> can can change the world <laughs> and and i mean but it's very impactful like in russia and china as well and yeah uh it's it's a bit i mean uh it's 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 maybe a truth but uh recently uh i i forgot or maybe we, we forgot already that how impactful a book is i mean uh, because in book, uh, the book in our surrounding nowadays are, are more popular compared to the classical ones. Yeah, classical. We, we cannot see a classical book from our age now, right? <laughs> yet. <laughs> Just yet. <laughs> okay. Uh, a question. Someone has a question. Yeah, from me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but first, first, a comment first before my question. So actually, it reminds me of the book that I discussed maybe in last month or the previous one about the true believer. First, Karl Marx wrote the idea, but the people after that took the idea to the extreme. Well, the, like Karl Marx himself was quite moderate and he was not poor, as people say. It. And secondly, I was thinking about why, why did this book became popular because there were many books, right? But why this one had such an impact? And actually, again, I'm reminded of the book that I read about the true believer. Maybe that's because so many people at that time was frustrated with the situation. So this book came at the right time. It gave an answer, an outlet for their frustration. This, this is what I mean. This is what I'm trying to say. Maybe something like that. And because of that, it, it caught fire and become quite spread. So that's my comment. And my question is that it, from what I see in history, like for example in China, it seems that the idea failed because when Mao tried to implement it, the result was hunger and millions of people died. I think something similar also happened in Russia. And when Deng Xiaoping yeah. replaced Mao, he actually declared that it was wrong. Mao at that time, and then Xiaoping famously said that I don't care whether it is black cat or white cat as long as it can catch a mouse, meaning capitalism yeah. is fine as long as people can prosper. So what was your thought about that? Yes, first of all, I also agree with your uh, statement about the frustrated. Actually, I rem uh, it reminds me of your statement that time when you talk about your book the target people who are easy targets, right? Those who are frustrated. And I actually believe so. It was the height of industrial revolution. The people that I mentioned never saw the sun because they're just trapped in factory. They're trapped in mines, basically, that time, right? So they're frustrated and saw this as a way out, of course. And second, there are people who know people are frustrated Although they're not frustrated themselves, they saw this as an, an opportunity. So this is how I can seize power, basically, right? So as has been um, illustrated in the animal farm, for example, even those who were able to implement communism or socialism, they also became rich, <laughs> right? So they totally, um, what it called, totally defied the idea originally. Now the one who are rich, not the industrialists, but the politicians are rich because of the communism or socialism. So totally, uh, there's totally, uh, there's a lot of flaws 
in the Karl Marx idea. Yeah. And I believe that, yes, there are people who took advantage of this idea and just run with it. That's why they write another book, like Lenin wrote another book, to interpret Marxism, to justify his actions and uh, Russian Revolution, Bolshevik, right? That one. And then the next one is about um, the grip, the great leap forward. Actually, I wrote about it on my presentation. So I will share it with you. Uh, there is this thing called the great leap forward. Uh, when the people tried to implement this in, in China, the result was famine. Yeah. The great leap forward. I'm not sure if I have it. Oh, wait, wait. Was it? Did I ask my students? Well, anyway, it's the great leap forward. And this was also not only in China, it was tried to be implemented in Cambodia and Myanmar, if I'm not mistaken, by Pol Pot or Cambodia, right? So they basically put people in commune. So they separate families, guys live with guys, women live with women, and all children live in their own children's quarters. Everyone was somehow given division of labor, basically, right? and then try to produce agricultural result, result the best that they can. But the uh, result come out of this actually famine. Yeah, so there was a total failure. Um, this is expensive, a very expensive disaster, basically. So if you're interested, you can read further about the grip reformer. And that's actually when I said there's a weakness of Marxism is because although it spent a long time justifying the idea, it did not spend enough time about how to implement this idea. That's why people just interpret it as they like. That's why I comment. Done. <laughs> uh, can I ask a question? Oh yes, go ahead. Um, so actually, I basically agree with your point. Uh, there are some good ideas from the Marx, but the implementation is just really terrible. But at least in Indonesia, in Indonesia, somehow the term communism equals to anti-religion. Somehow it translates into like that. Uh, and whenever people uh, say or talk about that, uh, most people will call it you are as anti-Islam or anti-religion, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which is totally doesn't make sense because communism is about anti-capitalism, not not anti-religion. So, what do you think about that? Yes, well, partly because it was, of course, the propaganda during New Order, right? The New Order, but there was also a history about that. People combined Karl Marx's idea with Nietzsche's idea, Frederick Nietzsche idea. Frederick Misch, uh, Frederick, is that Frederick? What was his last name? Yeah, Frederick. Okay, Frederick Misch. Frederick Misch, uh, the book is called Da Spoke Zaratustra, if you want to read it. Yeah, it, he talked about, he criticized religion like hell, basically, right? Talking religion is like a drugs, something like that. Uh, opium, he said that time. Religion is an opium, this like that. So that is Misch. And uh, Hitler used niche ideas a lot, but then because of uh, the order, I'm not sure, they somehow got them mixed up. <laughs> so Marxism and niche idea was combined and then resulted in communism. But it's actually two separate people, uh, two separate thinkers and with two separate ideas. But somehow it merged when, they, when we talk about communism and socialism in Indonesia. So that's how I... Sorry. If, if, I, if I may add something, if I'm not mistaken, they say that religion is the tool that is used by the religious power to alleviate the pain of the people. So in order to give you comfort, they give you false hope in the form of religion so that they can keep enriching themselves. Maybe that's why they are combined. Yes, but that's not what Karl Marx said. It's actually an interpretation. Just like what Mao Zedong interpreted Marxism that said, there's nothing higher than government, including religion. Religion cannot be higher than the government. This is what Mao communism is. 
That's why in China, government is number one, right? You cannot even oh, religion is uh, must be under it basically. So I think in Indonesia we teach that communism is somehow is like Mao with interpretation of Marxism, yeah. But that's not what the original uh, Karl Marx uh, wrote. Thank you, Mbak Pipi. Okay. Uh, any any other questions? Oh, drinking. Cleo, right? Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> I recycle it though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Julie, if you still have time, I want I have one more question for Pipi. Sure. What is the best example in history that you can find that is closest to Karl Marx's ideal? Because the examples so far are so far, right? they have combined with. Yeah. There is a good example. It's enlightened Northern Europe is a good example of Marxism. So those countries such as Norway, Finland, Sweden, they have high tax. When the AOC talk about tax the rich, this is what they talk about. So the tax in Finland and Northern Europe basically are 50%. Can you guys imagine it hurts? <laughs> Your tax is 50%. But then the social security is really good. And all school are free until university and all this, like all of the socialist values uh, that Karl Marx was, was talking about are implemented in Norway and Finland. I'm not sure Sweden, but definitely Norway and Finland. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, additional new information, thanks. And <laughs> okay, next, uh, we're ready for next, uh, Donald Fajar Diaz. Fajar, are you ready? Or, oh, no, no, Donald first. Yeah. Okay, okay. Are ready? You. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, do you need me to share the, the guides for today? Well, I have already. Right. Yeah. Okay, great. So, the, thank you for the opportunity. The book that I'd like to present is The First Tycoon. It's an, a biography of Cornelius van der Beek. And it is titled first tycoon because he was the first tycoon, the first very rich person in the US. And after that, there were other tycoons like Rockefeller and Carnegie, Morgan and more. Vanderbilt. And yes, but Vanderbilt is first. And for me, the this book, what's the best key lesson from it? Well, it's difficult to answer it in a short way because it's a very insightful book for me. I have never read a book about the early 19th century before. So it's like being transported to a new world for me. And actually it, it gives a background to the book that people just, people just shared. I just checked at that Das Capital was published in 1867. So the book that I'm sharing actually gives a background, the previous stages before reaching that stage, because Underbuilt was born in 1794 and he started his business in the early 19th century. So there are stages. The first stage is actually people at that time, the business at that time were monopolized by were monopolized by the rich families. So if you are born in a certain family, you get government contract and you can monopolize that business. So that is the first order of business. But then there was a progress, there was a breakthrough. It's called Jacksonian, Jacksonian idea. So the Jacksonian idea says that everyone has the ability to compete. It must be free for everyone. The government should not give contract to certain family to monopolize a business and therefore Free competition should be uh, should be led should be the default for all business should be the order for all business. And Vanderbilt rose. He was a fierce competitor. 
So it's a good thing, but then these very good competitors became so good that they became so rich, and eventually the power was centered in them. So it's like full circle. Initially, the power was in the in the hands of those who are granted government contracts, but then free competition came. But then some very good competitors, by their merits, they amassed so much power. And this is the background of the test capital that PPG shared. So they are not evil, actually. They are very good competitors. They are good businessmen. But then they have so much power because of their merit. So that's the background. For me, this is a new thing because I never knew about early 19th century before. So yeah, sorry for the deviation. Back to the question. What the best key lesson from it? For me, the best key lesson is resourcefulness. Because Van der Beelt, from the early age, he was very resourceful. Meaning, he always tried to take the newest innovation. At that time, they used sailing ships, no steamboats yet. But when the technology came, he adopted the new technology, steamboats. And then railroad came, but not yet mainstream in 1830s. And he also involved himself in railroad. It was new technology back then because this was steam machine on land. Steamboat was steam machine on sea. And what impressed me, what impressed me the most with about resourcefulness is that when he was 69 years old, railroad became mainstream and he had the courage to leave the steamboat business behind and to pour out all his, all his resources to railroads. So he sold all his steamboats. I think this is not easy because you are already, when you are already rich, you already have a successful business and a new, a new wave comes, most people are complacent. But he had the courage to leave everything behind and just pour out all his resources into railroad business. And eventually he became way richer because of this. So this is the best key lesson for me. Wow. So you must be willing to reinvent yourself even when you are old. Because at that time the life expectancy was only 40 years old. Life expectancy. So 69 was very old. But he started railroad, focusing on railroad at the age of 69. So amazing in my opinion. Next question, what's your favorite part of the book? The favorite part for me is the history because there are many things that we take for granted today actually came at that era. There are so many things, for example, corporation. Corporation was not common at the time. Most people just open shop by themselves and then the stock market, so many things. I don't have time. For example, New York City was in the beginning just a town. So it's quite funny when I read the book because herds and flock roam in the road of New York City. Can you imagine that like a village in the beginning of the 19th century, but became a great metropolis by the end of the book. So it's a very transformative era. And there are many others because there is also an explanation about the civil war and how it affects government. The government was initially very small they didn't even have resources to amount a war. But because of civil war, there was a lot of transformation. For example, income tax, revenue tax for people, income tax came at that time. So, so many things that we take for granted today had the origin at the era. So that is the favorite part of the book for me because it's like opening, wow, so this is why. Also, this is why, where it came from, something like that. Number three, what's your least favorite? The least favorite part for me is the ideological discussion because at the time there were different parties, they have some different ideologies, but not very interesting for me. So I usually just read fast through those part, but most of the book are very captivating for me. Number four, how did it impact you? It, it's inspiring for me from the Vanderbilt himself as a person and also from the era, how they evolved through the era, how they adapt new innovation, how railroads eventually became a bubble, similar to our business notice, 
our like real estate into a and then the internet.com so wow the history is just repeating itself so yeah it's inspiring and insightful for me because i get to know oh so this is how the world works and not new but has repeated itself this this book remind you of any other books and not really because this is the first book that i read about the 19th century so it's eye-opening for me and i haven't read any other book from that era actually there is another book called titan about john d rockefeller the oil titan but that is after Vanderbilt. so the railroads already became big and then oil became the main product but that is the next the second part of the 19th century so i think i think that is the closest book that i'm reminded of okay thank you thank you uh, question i i have a question uh, uh it's it's interesting that uh knowing the the, the biography is, is very interesting because uh we, we 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 go next to the person or we we see their their life again even when they are not here and but i i, I want to know about the, the the cycle about i haven't read that book yet i would like to know uh what's According to you, uh, you already know the pattern, uh, like the dot com bubble and the, the things that happen in our recent history. What's the next history according if, if you take the reflection from the book? Like what's what's happening? So big event. Mm -hmm. yeah. Even after 2021. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, because I heard the idea that the pattern it keeps cycling. It's uh, the same pattern happening again. Like the inflation pattern is going to be the same. That kind of burst thing. Yeah, it keeps so, happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the pattern is that something new comes. Actually, there is a term for this. It is called Gartner hype cycle. Gartner hype cycle. So something new comes, and then people get excited about it. And then the some pioneers start investing in it, but then the mainstream follow, and then they offer expand. They offer expand, and it becomes a bubble. And because the nobody wants to get left behind in a so-called gold rush, they borrow money usually. They leverage. They use leverage. They want to expand as much as they can, so they just borrow and borrow and borrow money and invest. And because it now becomes a bubble, at some point with a small trigger, it will collapse. So actually, it happens off and off again, like in real estate. And in this case, in the book is railroads. So just the same thing. Something new came. Railroad is a good thing. People got excited. They invested into it. The first pioneers were quite, were quite cautious, but when it became successful, the next wave they want to ride the wave, they borrow money heavily to invest and expand fast. And then something, a uh, small disturbance happen, they cannot pay. And then it becomes a, the bubble collapse. Yeah. And those who can survive the bubble will be able to ride the next wave. In this case, Vanderbilt was able to survive. I have to comment on this. Um... First, I, I've never read the book on Vanderbilt before, but I watched a documentary on History Channel about Vanderbilt. And apart from what Donald said, the, re re uh, the lesson is about being resourceful, right, Donald? But I think it was a really uh, a series of good decisions, obviously, like the one you mentioned, right? The right time to invest on steam engine and then leave steam engine behind steam boat behind and then go to train uh investing in train things like that that's a series of good decisions but also he took a huge risk he was willing to take a huge risk that time uh even someone rich as Vanderbilt, he had to borrow mining too to build the railroad it's not like he had the money in the reserve to build it right so he had to take a huge risk to be able to do it and including selling all of his steam engine business. It's also a huge risk, right? What if he didn't work? So I think 
uh, willing to take a big risk is part of uh, the reason why Vanderbilt was successful. However, when we go back to Karl Marx, when it, we come to talk about that, it's not only because he was willing to compete, he was a good competitor, but there are so many victims of Vanderbilt uh, endeavor. For example, those who built the railroads, a lot of them died. A lot of the workers who built the transatlantic railroad died in the process, right? And also the land that they had to they had to kick out the Indian uh, land basically, right? To be able to build this road. And then another thing is they imported a lot of Chinese workers that time because they and also Irish workers. So Chinese and Irish immigrants were, were employed by the Vanderbilt, and it created a lot of. Uh, friction in the society that called as the yellow peril because the Vanderbilt chose to employ immigrants from Ireland and China so they could be paid cheaply basically as opposed to other uh, race or whatever right that time so that created tension in the society almost like what happened right now in America, when you know, like the uh, uh, immigrant take the I don't know the job in the lower level, this is exactly what happened in the Vanderbilt era. So maybe it was not mentioned in the book because they tried to make Vanderbilt look good. <laughs> I would say. Okay, so that's that way. But I would like to ask you about this. How? Uh, you... Sorry, before your question, yes. can I comment on your yeah, comment? Of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there are two parts. First one, the first one is about borrowing money, and the second part is about employing workers for the railroads. So the first, for the first part, actually Vanderbilt was able to survive the bubble because he personally didn't like to borrow money. So he always paid in cash. That's what he said. So when there was a great crisis in 1870, he survived. So he. This mode of operation is that he broke stock of a company in cash, and that that company will borrow money by issuing bonds. So the company borrows money, but not Vanderbilt personally. Vanderbilt, sorry, on behalf of them. Him. Yeah, but the liability is on the company. Oh, okay. okay. Vanderbilt as a person doesn't like to borrow money. He always pays in cash. Always paid in cash. So that's the first part. Now for the second part. Uh, the Van Vanderbilt's role in railroads was actually not as a builder mainly, so he didn't build the transcontinental lines. He did build some infrastructure, but that was not his main role. So his main role was more as a financier. He booked stock of the existing railroads and then make the operation more efficient, and then some somebody else will try to attack him. He will defend himself, and eventually he will he will acquire this other company. So there are some other names mentioned in the book. I don't remember who built railroads through the transcontinental lines. So maybe those are the people who employ the workers that you mentioned. But sorry, Two companies. One is so there were Vanderbilt actually built from New York from the Atlantic to the middle, and there's another one who built from West Coast to the middle. So they were racing to get in the middle. Yeah, but from the documentary. Yeah, but in the book, he mainly just acquired existing lines, not building. So he started with something small in Manhattan, Manhattan, New York, and then he acquired an existing lines called New York Central to go out of Manhattan to Central America and then yet another line. So they already have the railroads in place. But then yes, he fixed it. So yes, yes, he built something, but that is not his main role. So there are some other people, some names, I don't remember the names, who built a lot of railroads. But his main role was as playing in the financial market to acquire the stock of these companies. So quite different and quite modern for that era. Okay, okay, okay. okay sorry okay. for for long comment. <laughs> so okay. Oh, I have a question. 
But oh, okay, go ahead. Other people first. I just finished speaking. Our oh. question comes later. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, one quick question can also, but uh, we we only have like forty minutes left. Okay. Uh, very quick question. Does the author mention about slavery at the time? Yes, that was the cause of the civil war. Uh, but at the time, the the person still at the time the slavery was still legal, right? When he was alive. So there are two parts of the United States: the northern and the southern. Vanderbilt lived in the northern part, and in the northern part, there was no slavery. It, it is the short-term states that had slavery because they plant cotton. They plant cotton and then they sell cotton to New York. So the short-term states, they had slavery, but not the northern states. That's why the civil war was between the north and the south. And Vanderbilt was in the north, so no slavery there. Vanderbilt did not like slavery, fortunately. But we do one question. Oh yes, my question is how do we with this? Did he mentioned did he feel guilty at all with the setting of the government that time that he got a lot of privilege because he got the government contract with all of these things. I mean, did he I don't know whether the book is about him because he didn't read it himself, obviously, right? It's just about him. Right? So did is there any uh, admit that, oh, okay, it's partly because of nepotism or this? So. Um, no, so the era when Vanderbilt grew up, that was the era of nepotism. So someone was awarded government contract because they are from a rich family. But, but Vanderbilt came to in the next era of free competition. So he started on his own. In fact, he often had to fight against businesses that were subsidized. For example, at the time there was gold rush in California. So because there is still there was still no rail railroads, they had to go by sea through Panama. And at that time, the the main land was, was subsidized by the government. But Vanderbilt decided to start up his own line and it was not subsidized. But he tried to compete with better service, trying to find a shorter route, and eventually he won business despite not being subsidized. So it's the opposite, actually. And the same thing happened so again. He, yeah, so he did not benefit from nepotism then. No, it's only okay, the opposite. Good, good, good. Yeah. okay. He, he, he beat those who got benefit from nepotism with his resourcefulness. Oh, we need to learn from Vanderbilt because we are now still within the era of nepotism. Yeah, so we might need to learn from Vanderbilt. How oh, we please share the result after, yeah? Please. <laughs> it's, real, it's beneficial for us. Hmm important for us <laughs> thank you so much donald uh thank you Pippi. uh next who wanna go first i think fajar you wanna go next uh still mute sorry okay hello yeah so let me share my screen first by the way, sorry, my drawing is quite bad, but please just enjoy. Can you see? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Coming up. <clears throat> Wait. It will just holy crap. <laughs> I think the PowerPoint just crashed and I didn't save it. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Okay, maybe I will just simply talk. Uh, okay, so 
Today, I will talk about it, the frog, uh, how to beat uh, pro 21 ways to beat procrastination. I read this because I am a rather procrastinator and I am seeking some solution how to beat these old habits. And there are some key lessons that I have learned from this book. So maybe while uh, I speak, I just draw yeah, on PowerPoint <laughs> to make it better. What is, what is it? Uh, or do you want to change after, but yes, maybe? Uh, I think maybe that's the better option. I can just prepare the PPT again. Okay. Uh, so maybe the yes first, yeah? <laughs> Save it ten seconds. Okay. Hello. <laughs> but yes, yay. Uh, I think uh, we have like uh, 18 minutes. Sure. Anyway, I, I cannot talk too much anyway sure. because um just just a bit story. I just had my braces like a week ago, so um I'm still adjusting in this particular substance, additional particular substance <laughs> added to to it to my mouth. So um it's kind of hurt when I talk. So I don't know how Pipit can manage. How many years already, Pipit? <laughs> Nine years. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Almost a decade, yeah. So it's it's been a week and then I keep on. I don't know what it what it called. My my lips keep on stuck when I talk. So anyway, I'm not. It's just as um, it's gonna be a short explanation anyway. So my book, uh, the, the book that I'm going to discuss is Free Economics, and um, I haven't finished it yet, unfortunately. But um, uh, to sum up for this uh, this this discussion. I have read the summary and uh, I have also read the summary. And um, uh, Jay, would you mind to share the, um, or you cannot share because Fajar just shared the uh, pre um, the presentation. Okay. I forgot the I forgot the quick the questions actually. Sorry. So the. Um, why am I decided to read this book? Because it's been long time here in my uh ebook ebook PDF, so I think it's about time to read it anyway. So the best key le lesson from it is, for me, it reminds me of a song "Money," and then also price tag because <laughs> eventually, I uh, eventually and actually and reality, everything in our life somehow it is based on money and um even though free economics didn't state the money but um the author uh, more in using the terms of incentives which is um, more relatable for us uh, who works in organizations or in companies so the best key lesson from it um, money is everything <laughs> Money is the trigger and money is the motivation. That's the best key lesson from my side. And then second, what's my, uh, my favorite part of the book? It's the first chapter. It is when the, when the author really explains an example um, how money relates, uh, how, how money is related to, to decision that uh, people is going to make so in the first chapter there is a there is an example of a daycare for kids and um all the teachers over there oh, all the nannies over there are overwhelmed because most of parents are picking up their kids late so it should have been an afternoon but then they say oh i'm so sorry i was busy at work and then they come three hours later they come four hours later and then this, uh, the daycare decided to go to to have a like a penalty like uh, if you late when you're picking up your kids then you have to pay certain amount of money and it doesn't work because people people will pick will choose to okay I'll just pay no I, I don't care if I'm late but um 
I'll just pay and that's it. So um, uh, it's an eye opening actually since the very first part. And um, number three, what's your least favorite? Um, so far, I don't have any least favorite because it keeps on it keeps on adding to new information and new examples that I can take from this book. And how did it impact you? Um, it doesn't really impact me that much, but now I do understand why organizations and company do have incentives and how it affects me before when uh, when working in hospitality industry where um, oh, where you will get more money, you will get more bonus if you have uh, if you have compliments from your guests, if you have compliments from your flight mate, let's say, and then and if you have uh, if you have a gratitude letter from the passenger, something like that. So uh, it helps me to understand why organizations and company they have this certain decision to input and implement the incentives for, for the staff. And number five, did this book remind you of any other books? Uh, it reminds me of Misbehaving, actually, which book brewers read it year, uh, a year ago or so. And also it reminds me of uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. Even though Thinking Fast and Slow, that's not really talking about economics, but it's more to psychology. But for me, it's related because uh, it's all about making decision and how does it affect you and how does it uh, um what do you call it? how does it affect your life in some way so i think that's it what i can what i can share regarding the book thank you <laughs> it's a short one yeah <laughs> thank you i think you can stop sharing the screen though thank you um but yes yeah uh, can I ask a question? Still, can you? Okay, got it. Mm. Okay. So after after you know the the motive, after you see that money is so that powerful, and then you you see uh by having your experience of working that uh compliment thing that will will give you more money. Uh, what what actually can you uh what actually change you or impact you later on after you know that thing? Like by knowing is is one thing, but what what what's the impact later? Mm, I don't think I'm in the right position to implement incentives in some way, uh, because um, most of the most of the examples, um, most of the examples on this book is um, how incentive. Uh, motivates motivates the staff to do their best and um even though there there can be some bad side you know so just imagine if the if you're staying in a hotel and then you got a very you get a very good service and then um, you feel so wow you feel so flattered oh my god everyone is so nice here well actually it's not because they have the money as the motivation so Maybe they're actually mean people. Maybe they're actually crazy people. But you don't see it that way, though. You 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 see them as a as a nice person who who do a good service to you and then who provide you with um well everything everything great about the service they will provide you. So um, does it uh how can I say um, um for me personally um. I'm trying my best not to not to do the service or to do the um to provide uh to provide the hospitality based on money mm -hmm. but um I think it will be the, the 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 impact later on maybe if I'm if I'm in the if I'm in the let's say in a higher position where I can give incentives I'll give incentives to to a more uh, to a more what do you call it? to a person who can work better in a team rather than getting some compliments getting some compliments from the guest that's uh, that's uh, that's that's what i thought uh, that's what i have in mind at the moment because compliments from the guest is 
maybe five to ten seconds the first impression but then if you have if you have a, a if your teammates if your if your colleagues um, comfortable working with you for me that's that's a be that's a better alternatives to give incentives so i hope that answers thank you okay uh thank you so uh so by have, by knowing the the background you know uh which way to choose it, it improves your decision uh mm -hmm. quality, right? oh. exactly got it thank you uh uh does anyone have any other questions uh, mau nanya, enggak, <laughs> okay no no yeah i think donald donald already has read this book as well right donald, years ago me too so my i, I, I have also of... keep reading you your conclusion will be different <laughs> serious <laughs> go ahead Fajar. i don't want to ask anything i have already read the book <laughs> oh that's why <what> <laughs> <laughs> so the the Pipit already read the book. Donald read the book. Fajar read the book. Michelle, you I too. have the book. I have the book. Oh, you have the book, but you haven't. You read have it. the book, but have not read it. Okay, so I think better for next month because Pipit already, Donald, and Fajar and me, and next month it will be you. <laughs> I, I, in my opinion, for economics, I is I got five out of five from five stars. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. But yeah. um yeah, the actual lesson is almost the end. It's not about money, in my opinion. It's about nothing is as it seems. Nothing is as it seems. So we see something from the surface. That's why the cover is what apple? Yeah. Orange is orange. Oh. Orange, but the like, apple, but the inside is orange, for example, right? So oh. thing from the outside it looks like uh a but then after we use economy theory or model to investigate finally in the end oh this is not a this is b so that's oh. actually that's that. makes sense uh, it also reminds me of uh this book where experts go wrong it's black swan actually because it's it's yeah, also it's mentioned awesome. it's also mentioned about uh we cannot we cannot really trust experts anyway because they are still human. They can make some human error, but um, for me, the, um, it's it's uh, it's a little bit more digestible compared to Black Swan. So I enjoy this one so much. Agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Oh yeah, my baby. Uh -huh. So uh, to get spoiler, maybe the this book is very controversial economics and has been debated between Republican and Democrats because of the part about abortion. Right? Mm, yeah. Yeah, so there's a, a really high crime in the 80s and people think it's going to go up, up, up and up. But it turned out in early 90s, suddenly crimes dropped. Like what happened? What was the result? There's nothing changed, nothing changed in the police department, nothing changed in economy, nothing changed basically, but then he, tried to compare the data and found out that the crime rate drops because there was abortion law 20 years before. Abortion was legalized 20 years before. So the criminals to be were aborted, <laughs> basically. It was very controversial, right? And a lot of people put this book in a controversialist because of that statement. Okay. Okay, thank you. I think I need to read that book. You have to. <laughs> yeah. We recommend uh, it though. Uh, I just have a comment because I read economics a long time ago, so I no longer remember the specifics. But the two things that uh, stood that stands in my mind is that first, you need to look at the data to find the truth, and you cannot just think that you know it, but you need to look at the data. And second, incentive is everything or almost everything. Powerful. <laughs> but, but incentive is not just monetarily. In fact, the example that you gave about the daycare, daycare right? when the parents were late in picking up, they turn a social incentive in the in the form of social stigma. Wow, you you are late. You make you cost trouble to for all of us into a financial 
incentive, I just need to pay and I don't need to feel guilty. So actually, it's the opposite of money is everything. In my opinion. It's just that incentive is deeper than just money. Yeah, because I just need to pay something and I no longer need to behave well. So we need to dig deep into people's motivation to find the real incentive. I don't know whether that's the correct evolution because I've read it a long time ago. So feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Donald. Yes, any comment? No, I just want to say that's exactly what I remember as well. So, oh, it's pricing sometimes we plan to do A, but then in the end, the result is B, right? Because we misread people's incentives. Oh, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. okay, cool. Thank you, Mbak Uh, any other question for Diaz? Comments? No? Okay, then Fajar, let's go ahead. Thank you, Madias, for sharing it. It motivates me to finally read that book. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay. Okay, so yeah. today I will talk about this book, but because uh, the time is limited, I will just talk it rather briefly. So uh, I today I would like to discuss about Eat That Frog, 21 Great Ways to Stop Procrastinating in and Get More Done in Less Time by Brian Tracy. So Brian Tracy, as what you know, have uh, written like 40 or 50 self-help books. So he's basically an expert in helping us to be a better person. Okay, so there are many key lessons and in his book, he mentioned about 21. <laughs> but of course, uh, I will not be talking about 21 i will just pick three uh, and the three that i like the most and uh, one the first one that i like is to set the table or basically to clarify your goal okay okay so in our life uh, we have our personal goals right i don't know maybe uh, some uh, relationship goal or uh, some financial or some health, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. We all have goals, but if we don't really clarify this goal, it is very easy for us to get distracted along the way. It should be go here, but somehow I'm distracted here. So for example, uh, something that I should not have done, uh, just a, a few weeks ago, I, I, I decided to write a, a very lengthy, guide in a, for, a, for a gaming community. I really enjoy it actually, and many people praise that. But uh, after I read this, this gaming guide has nothing to do with the, the goal that I have in mind, right? And maybe other people have something, uh, the, the far goal, but the they are distracted. So by clarifying your goal, whether it is relationship or maybe finance or maybe health or et cetera, et cetera, uh, you, you can have like the Northern Star, some guide on what things that you want to achieve. So before you go and take the journey, you have to know where do you want to go first. Next is the Pareto distribution or the 80%, 20%. I, I believe that many of you have already read about this. Basically, uh, this concept uh, mentioned about 20% uh, of activity account for 80% of result. Yeah. And I actually already understand about this. And uh, I, I become remember again. For example, health. Health is actually um, part of the 20%, right? Because if we are sick, then it costs like so much uh, money, like it costs like finance. For example, my, uh, actually, for example, just uh, one week ago, I had a very, very bad mark, ma because I didn't take care of my sleeping habit and it cost about 14, 400,000 rupiah just because of my decision, right? And in the long term, like um, for, the, for the really bad, the heart disease, uh, it costs like, I don't know, one million. 
and one million is like how many years do you say for one million like maybe 10 years maybe or five years so uh, the for example the health is a part of the 20 percent uh, and at least for me uh, for for the, the current me my 20 percent for right now is to finish my thesis nothing else <laughs> uh, the other stuff are just maybe you can do it later yeah uh, just take care of the original one and to finish the thesis as best as possible and that's about it okay and then uh, it uh, the the third concept is eat the frog first just like this guy <laughs> you have to eat the frog first uh, what does it mean it means uh, do the most important uh, first uh, usually we all usually people uh, procrastinate the important tasks because important tasks are difficult it, it is challenging and it is complex, but in the long term, uh, if we eat the frog first, it can help us the most. It is like the 20%, right? The frog is like the 20%. You have to eat it, don't eat the, uh, the snacks or the desserts, et cetera, et cetera. You can eat it later. Uh, why, do, why do you eat it first? Because uh, as I said before, uh, the, the frog is not tasty. <laughs> it tastes bad, and we tend to procrastinate it a lot, like really bad. So the best way to not procrastinate is just to eat it first, right in the morning. Yeah. After you wake up, you prepare, just do and eat the frog first. Uh, there is a part in the, in the book. Uh, basically, one employee said to the boss, uh, boss, let me do the 20% most important. I guarantee that my productivity will be so much better. And the boss said, okay, prove it to me. And after he only focused on the 20% of the most important, uh, his productivity rise like two times or three times. So that is incredible. But those three, the eat the frog, the parity distribution, and also set the table and clarify your goal, it's like the three concepts that I like the most. Oh. Okay, what I like from the book, wait, oh yeah. What I like the book is, it is like eating a citato. <laughs> it is easy to read, and it is actually a common sense. And actually, uh, I read this while I was listen listening to the book, uh, just before I sleep, uh, while I was half, half asleep so it, it doesn't need any concentration at all so very very easy to digest uh, but uh, at the same time it is also very very good information what i dislike the most maybe it is about the, the concern of the self-help books knowing is not equal to doing uh, although we know stuff I already know the book actually. The concept is actually like repeated like 100 times, times already. But knowing it's not equal to, to doing. And I think maybe the solution is that uh, reading once is not, is not enough. Maybe we have to uh, repeat it often. So we can uh, be reminded again and again and eventually it become part of our habit, hopefully. Okay, and maybe that's all. And um, basically this book is actually quite similar to other books. Like this is the information are generic, like the typical self-help book, but at the same time, it is also uh, really correct. And, and if we can apply that, that will be really good. That's all, any question? Ajar, I'd like to comment about procrastination. Yes. About procrastination. Mm. As someone who procrastinate a lot, <laughs> I can only minimize it, but not really make it disappear. So um, for me, it, that frog is, um, yes, it is very simple and very applicable, but uh, for me personally, the for me personally, the one that, I, that really um, changed my mind is this atomic habits actually, because I it's really, 
it's really here in my mind every time that even one percent even one percent changes going to better meaning that it will equal to 38 percent something mm -hmm. in yeah. in improvement so um it's okay if it's just little or it's just very tiny tiny steps but as long as you keep on doing it then that's the goal anyhow because you reach for the constants you you, you are reaching the um the stability instead of like the big change or whatsoever because yeah procrastination is because it's also related to um, the way of you doing something and the way um you choose like for example between netflix and study of course we want netflix right <laughs> not study but it it's but but by watching netflix first that doesn't mean that the paper will be finished immediately this is this is a paper where you need to write it down it's not jongrang, you know it's like one night and then after that finish it's not like that so um yeah I, uh, as someone who ha who have a very bad procrastination um i can i can only say that uh it's okay to do tiny steps but as long as you keep on doing it that it will be better <laughs> thank you yeah actually i agree with that i really agree uh, and usually from other books the there are two kind of changes. There are the slow, um, slow changes. There's also radical changes. Usually, people prefer the radical, like the uh, I don't know. Oh, Putri, huh? yeah, the, the prodigy, yeah, old 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 key. But actually, usually the culture key is very hard. I have tried uh, <laughs> it fell so many times. So I just pick with the slow but sure way. Okay, any other comments or questions? My question is, is there any explanation about, in the book about why it's so hard to eat the frog? No. Uh... No, it's useless then. It's almost like, <laughs> like telling the slogan of Nike, but write it in the book. Just, just do it. Anywhere, I think right? that the person, the Brian Tracy, is like the very choleric, very productive in his gene. You know, It is natural for him to be very productive. <laughs> so, uh, well, I, so I like to say all of us here are kind of productive, but then there's a degree of procrastinator in us. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure a lot of your friends, our friends, tell us we're productive, right? Mm -hmm. you, yeah. yeah. Right? We consider ourselves procrastinated. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, just different perspective, is it? We see ourselves as procrastinator, but when compared to <laughs> to the surrounding, it's not we're not we are not that bad. But <laughs> Maybe because anyhow, and I tell yeah. myself, I'm not procrastinator to my colleagues or something. They say, "What are you talking about? You're not right. You don't understand anyway." But I think it's about degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically, it's more like advice and to the point. Not much explanation. Just do it, basically. <laughs> that's that's the yes, way of the brain. Related to what Diaz said, related to what Diaz said with the uh, atomic habit, right? Yes, there's yeah. a really good strategy to eat the frog. Mm -hmm. Couple it with something. There's no way you can miss. For example, like you can, but it. Yeah. Couple, pasangkan, match it with other things that you yeah. never fail to. For example, brushing your teeth. Stack it with other activities Stack that you enjoy. Second. So, for example, whenever I brush my teeth, I will work out. <laughs> One push up in, in the bedroom. Yeah. How? Yeah. Yes, like, you, okay. So, I mean, brushing my teeth is taking care of my teeth, right? So, exercise is taking care of my body. So, whenever I brush my teeth, I have to also take care of my body. That's like the logic. But it didn't work for me. It did not work for me. I coupled my YouTube watching with exercising. So I said, when I watch YouTube, I will exercise at the same time. But after I do that, I never watch, watch YouTube anymore. Because <laughs> I don't want to exercise. <laughs> Just from economics. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs>
<laughs> anyway, the, uh, I shared a TED Talk uh, from Tim Orban. It's one of the highest views after all this time. It's um, he's a funny guy actually, Tim Orban. It's it's about procrastination. So just in case you need some other inspiration regarding procrastination, there you go. Don't read it. Just watch it. Thank you. Finish. <laughs> Or maybe I'd like to add about there's a term in psychology they call it hyperfocus. So people who procrastinate sometimes they develop develop hyperfocus. So they will focus on something that actually not important too much and avoid other things. So this is uh, hyperfocus is the term in psychology. It's a disease. Oh, it's a disease. Yeah, it's not that it's like this one. <laughs> ah, on purpose? <laughs> Why would we procrastinate on purpose? Can you explain? As you saw, I haven't read the book. <laughs> <laughs> and then there you go, you procrastination on purpose. <laughs> Oh, but this is, uh, I, I, I skim, it's about like efficiency, increasing the efficiency, mm. like uh, delay the unimportant things. Mm. <laughs> I found yeah. a really good quote the other day, doing the most sense in the least amount of time. Ah, yeah. That's how to be efficient. Not easy to do though. No, that's like trying to be a computer. <laughs> <laughs> the most sense in the least amount of time. That's like what computer does. Oh, anyway, who lost? Oh, Fajar lost connection. Oh, and go back to Michael. Okay. Okay. It's it's already uh two in the afternoon. So that's all our, our meeting today. Uh thank you for our session today. I got a lot of insight and I hope you as a watcher in YouTube uh got the insight as well. And if you're interested, just contact here and yeah and thank you so much and see you next month in 2022 <laughs> bye bye thank you everyone wait we haven't taken photo oh yeah yeah we haven't we... taken photo okay, okay. oh we'll uh, edit fajar in we'll edit fajar in <laughs> oh okay <laughs> wait uh, i'll open the book yeah just a sec all right, all right. i'll open the book open the book and my okay I'll just take two to represent Fajar. I'll do it, yeah? One, two, three. Yeah, let me check. Oh, technically, oh. I got Fajar's photo, but when he was doing this, like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> one more, oh, one more time. Oh, 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 one more. There okay, okay, okay. There you go. There he is. Okay. Fajar, are you with us? Yeah. Let's take photo quick. Take photo, take photo. Again, okay. One, two. What mathematics are it? One, two, three. Okay. Let me check. Done. All right. Okay. okay. All right. Take See care you everyone. next year. Have a good oh, weekend. Yes, like, like, uh, yes everyone. Happy New Year. See you next year. Bye-bye. Thank you.